All right, time to catch up with our guy, Michael Tulip, as Illinois basketball is back in the Big Ten title race. We're also going to have fun with uh, Ohio State job opening up. Probably won't be the last Big Ten job to open up. We'll break down the Big Ten jobs, all 18 of them now, into tier. So I'm looking forward to that, Mike. But uh, obviously, Illinois finally wins at Maryland, 85 to 80. They get that monkey off their back and allows them to stay in this Big Ten race. They're now four and three on the road in the Big Ten, which, as you know, is not easy uh, to win a road game. So what stood out most to you in that uh, Illinois was able to close out one here late? Yeah, I think going into that game, it was a growth opportunity regardless because you hadn't won at Maryland. You're coming off a blowout win against Michigan. So where, you know, what's, what's your attention to detail look like? What's your focus look like? What's your toughness look like? And I thought as the game went on, especially late, um, they went into soul snatching mode and that team is so capable of that. And when you look over the past few weeks, you know, I thought against Michigan state, you're on your heels a little bit more. Um, but this game, it just felt like they they kept their foot on the gas and uh, and they were tough and um, and you start to realize that when you go into that mode, it's a little bit more fun. Uh, like it just it just I could see it through the TV. It just looked like those guys were were having a blast and playing with joy and 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 playing with emotion. And I think that's when you get the best out of this group. So that was that was really awesome to see. What stood out to you about their demeanor, the way they executed? to close out a game after they had struggled to do that in regulation the last few games. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at the, the obvious reasons taking care of the ball, um, I thought they landed on a personnel group that I would expect to be their closing personnel group. And they were plus 16 for the game that, that, that group was, and that group, I think had played seven minutes with each other the whole season up until that point, which is, which is kind of crazy to think about given how thin that yeah that rotation really is. So just um, insert it here, Mike. Hawkins, Shannon, Domask, Rogers, Harmon. That was the group on the on the court to close the game. Yeah, and I think that's that that should be the group because yeah. I think it gives you the best blend of offense and defense and free throw shooting and um, you know, and they they really they really clamped down. And I thought in addition to taking care of the ball, in addition to the personnel. I thought offensively, every guy was really tuned in to what they wanted to run. Um, and what they wanted to run was, where's Kaiser? Let's spread you out. Let's get you into a switch. Let's attack downhill. And we're just going to keep taking turns and doing that. And and that's that's what their offense ended up being at the end. And I thought they executed it really well. Uh, there was a particular moment at the end of that game. It's 79-75. You know, Shannon is is lifted out almost by half court on the right side of the court. Damask is dribbling on the left side. You got, I think, Jameer Young guarding Damask. And then you have uh, you have Dante Scott kind of straddling in between both of them up top, kind of preparing himself for a potential ball screen or switch. And Kaiser is on Shannon. And initially Kaiser was on Harmon. And once Harmon got passed up to go up to set a screen for Damask because they wanted to get the switch back on Kaiser, uh, Kaiser pointed to Scott and just said, hey, take Harmon so that you can get the switch. And the second he did that, Damask looked at Shannon because Kaiser was guarding Shannon and just threw it. So now Harmon's lifted up by Damask. He throws it across. Shannon gets it. And he has all this real estate one-on-one with Kaiser and Kaiser had no chance Mm -hmm. and Shannon gets downhill and, and gets a, gets a foul call, goes to the free throw line. And those are the little things where you could tell everybody was just, everybody knew what the game plan was. Everybody knew what they needed to do to execute. And they did that, but you know, you also knock down free throws. Um, That's a big thing, but all of that to say you played like some dogs down the stretch, man. Mm -hmm. And that can cover up so much. That cover up that covers up offensive mistakes. That covers up defensive mistakes. When you just play hard and play with an intentionality with, with what you're doing, it's you know, you 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 win some games and you close out games, and they did that. Well, Mike, in the moment, I'm sitting there going, What is Kevin Willard doing? Uh does not foul 
as they're down four with 44 seconds out. I just feel like that's the time. I know they're not a good three point shooting team. And if Illinois makes free throws, they have to make threes, but that just felt like the time where you just extend the game and see what happens. Uh, and he wasn't asked about it in his press conference after the game. I would have loved to have asked about it, but uh, what did you make of that? Um, because it, it just felt like almost a white flag and a big gift to Illinois to run 25 seconds off the clock. That, that was the exact play that I was just talking about. Too. Yeah. Um, that was that same exact play. And look, that looked like a guy that to me looks like he trusted his defense more than his offense. You mm -hmm. kind of, you kind of touched on it there. I think you're, you know, there's a 15 second differential. I don't know. I mean, you still have to go down and you know, maybe you get a stop and, and you cut it to a one possession game and you say, Hey, that's relying on our defense again to, to potentially create a turnover on the press or on the inbounds. Um, I just think more times than not extending the game is the way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe Illinois ends up splitting one of those free throws. I mean, Terrence Shannon had, had just missed a free throw mm -hmm. right before that. So, um, yeah, it could kind of, kind of bizarre, uh, maybe the Illinois free throw shooting at that point, which I think was, was maybe like 26 or 30 or, or, or something crept into his mind where he just thought he was handing them two points, but. I mean, there's only a couple times I can remember, even recently, where you know a, a coach is elected not to. Uh, and, and but that's the thing, even in even in the NCAA, you don't get like the other night I'm watching Warrior Suns and Steve Kerr. I think it was a it was a two point game, and Steve Kerr elected not to foul with a three second differential. Hmm. And they end up forcing Devin Booker into a shot on the right wing. They get the rebound, but in college basketball, you can't advance it. Right. With the timeout. Right. They can call the timeout and advance it to half court. And then they get the inbound of Steph Curry. It's a three and they win. Um, but that's not the case in college basketball. So, right. So even, even extending the game at that point, you don't give yourself the opportunity to, or, or playing it out, like you don't give yourself the opportunity to advance the ball which right. is, which is huge. So didn't make a ton of sense. I think if you asked him, he, or maybe he wouldn't say, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe he would stick to, to, to what, uh, whatever his philosophy is, but, um, certainly a gift. It felt like. Yeah, right. certainly. Uh, you mentioned that Illinois played like dogs and, and Terrence Shannon Jr. Played like that on both ends of the court. Feels like Mike and talking with Brad Underwood after the game in the tunnel, like, they feel like Terrence Shannon is back to being Terrence Shannon. What stood out most to you about what he did at, at Maryland? And what does that mean that he's kind of returning to this form? Yeah, yeah, I forget the points and the offensive output. When he guards like that, there aren't, you know, two to three better players in the country than him, um, period. Like he is first team All American with a bullet. Like, and, and, and the potential for this team grows immensely. When he does that, because a guy like him with his size, with his speed, with the way he chases guys down, fighting over ball screens like that as your point of attack defensively is so valuable, especially when you get into March and you say, OK, what wins in March? It's typically guard play. And we have a guy that can stop that and can at least make you feel uncomfortable. And that is a, a really, really big weapon to have. Um and, and he's just, you can tell, like, he's, I think it was the Ohio State game where you felt like, okay, he's shaking the rust off a little bit. This looks a little bit more familiar. And certainly in the last three to four games, he's been, he's been incredible. And, and they've, they've needed every bit of it. And, and you think about how important this is down the stretch, being in this Big Ten title race. I think a lot of these guys play a hand in, in holding down the fort when Terrence was out, but Terrence certainly has a has a hand in keeping them in it at this point to even have a shot at, at getting Purdue. Yeah, and kudos to Underwood, kudos to these guys for for playing well when he was out, right? Going four and two, uh, winning some good games. But I, I thought Maryland, this was the biggest example yet of the difference Terrence Shannon makes, right? They okay. lose to Maryland, Jameer Young goes off. Uh, they just don't aren't able to get easy buckets. Terrence Shannon, 14 of 16 at the free throw line, draws 12 fouls, gets those easy points. Fast break, they won 19 to 2, mostly due to Shannon. Um, in, in the last two games, they're 41 to 10 in the fast break. They average eight more points a game in the fast break with Terrence Shannon. And then uh, our guy, Isaac Trotter, threw out that video of when he guarded Jameer Young, he was two for nine uh, from the court. And, and you just see Mike just 
how big and long he is, how good he is at kind of those, I guess, contesting from behind like he does when they play the ball screen that way. Um, it was just – it was a, an amazing performance. He's like a cheetah, man. I mean, he, like his closing speed, even when – like he's good at getting through ball screens. He gets hung up from time to time. But even when he gets hung up, his closing speed and his chase down speed is enough to – you know, when, when teams are wanting to shoot those, those tough twos, those floaters, when Coleman's kind of getting back in the drop, like he is such a weapon coming back. I think four times in the last two games, uh, he did it on Namari Burnett and he did it on young three times in, in that game where he was able to track him down and, and block his shot. So, I mean, what that does is now if you're a guard coming off and you got Shannon, like, even if you feel like you got space to operate in the back of your mind, you're, you're hearing footsteps and you're a little bit paranoid and, and I, you could feel that a little bit with, with, with Jameer. And, and I, I thought Justin Harmon did a really good job with that, with that late as well. So, um, you know, those, those two guys for sure. I mean, defensively, they bring, they bring something special when they, when they bring it every game, like this team is, this team, it's another gear for sure. Yeah, and it was cool to see like everybody made a play in that closing lineup. You know, Ty Rogers makes a couple free throws. We talk about the defense. Domask with his rebounds, but four, the all four other guys had a layup uh, within the last couple minutes, uh, and that was just impressive. Mike, they shot five for twenty from three, and Brad s- says, "What are you when you're not making shots?" And they still scored eighty five points. So, what stuck out to you about the offense's ability to create buckets and create points? Yeah, I thought making threes or missing threes, regardless of what the result was, they were still initiating that by driving gaps and getting into the paint. Um, that was really evident to start that game. Uh, Ty Rogers did it a few times. Terrence Shannon did it a few times. Damas did it a few times where they were just finding gaps, whether you wanted to zone, whether you wanted to go man. It was just, hey, can we – we're not just going east-west here. Like, let's get north-south. And those are – that's a toughness play. Right. Like we talk about toughness and I think that always comes in the form of like diving on a loose ball and boxing out and all the physical things. But having that mentality of finding those gaps and, hey, you know, there may be a crevice here. But if I if I'm strong with the ball and I play off of two feet, um, then I can get in here and create attention to be able to to get more inside out looks. A jump stop, Mike. A jump stop. A jump stop. Terrence had one in the game and laid it in. I was elated i'm sure you were jumping up and it was down going. It was going is at the xfinity center um no it's just been it's been awesome to see and and they they played with i this is the most variety that an, an illinois basketball team has played with offensively since brad underwood's been here mm-hmm. and that, i think that speaks to the personnel um it speaks to the i think the type of stuff that they're that they're running um like even even last game against michigan they run Kind of out of nowhere. They hadn't been running it a ton, but they run this chin action to where they get Hawkins able to throw a bullet to Damascus under the basket. And chin action is just you kind of have a triangle with guys setting a back screen, two guys up top, guy comes off, and then you kind of just play off that continuity in the middle. Um, they were able to do that, and they sprinkle in some hunting of mismatches like they did late game. Um, they're running pistol actions on the side where it's just, you know, a Two on one ball screen, or it's a reverse ball screen to get a matchup you want. Um, they've run like roll reverse or or roll and replace type actions as well. I mean, they've they've had so much variety, but it's all simplified too. Like it's it's initial bases and and uh, foundations, but then it's guys making plays out of it, and and that's when you become really hard to guard because if you're a twenty five thirty action type team per game i mean you have opposing coaching staffs that can sit in film rooms all day and go on the scout team court all day and 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 rep those set plays but when you just have when you just have matchups and when you just have continuities it's hard to guard man illinois since december 1st has the number two offensive efficiency in the country since the bragg and rights game number one in the country, right? <laughs> kudos, kudos to Brad, his staff. Tyler Underwood's a big part of this as yeah. well. Uh, and they found the right personnel, Mike. Um, Illinois fans, you have one of the elite offenses in the Big Ten or in the country right now. No, no question. And, and look, I think a lot of that has been triggered from the more that you know the gravity of Terrence Shannon. There's, there's no question. Um, 
Coleman Hawkins and Quincy Gary kind of finding their footing from that, really from that point, shooting the basketball. Um, but Marcus Damask and his aggression going from, man, what we saw in the non-conference where it was like when he's playing Oakland, when he's playing some of these teams, and you're like, man, I just – like there's a gap there, man. Mm-hmm. Like you can – like enough of this East-West stuff. Can you get downhill? And and the Northwestern game, he powers up and dunks off a of two feet, and, and he's become so much more of a confrontational driver, and that's so valuable because not only do you bring the defense in and you're able to spray the ball around, but, you know, you're also able to – get to the free throw line. He's a really good free throw shooter. And I think the style a lot. So a lot of what contributes into offensive efficiency, as you know, I mean, it's not just the ability to put the ball in the basket. It's taking care of the ball as well. Been way better at that lately. And, and that is also a function of booty ball and hunting matchups because, you know, you have the ball in a guy's hands that can make, make reads pass out of the long post and they're quicker options to where you're not having to swing the ball inside out, inside out. Like there, you know, there's, there's, or like run sets that can get blown up and now there's turnovers there or have the ball in guys' hands that you're not necessarily comfortable with. Like they've, the more they found their identity offensively, the more those turnovers have come down. And that's just another big reason why they've been so, so strong in that area. Maryland's not a great offensive team. Illinois gave up 80 points to them. A lot of that, I thought, was due to fouling, like giving up uh, 29 free throws in this game. But we did see some defensive adjustments. We saw some blitzing of Jameer Young. We saw some doubling of Julian Reese. Uh, Kind of a mixed bag defensively, but how do you come out of it? You're feeling any better about the defense, whether it's the approach or the execution? I think the open-mindedness is is cool to see. it's interesting to see some of these coaches operate. And this is, this isn't just Brad Underwood. This is uh, you see across the league where, you know, I think in, you know, sometimes you'll roll out certain things in a game and you'll test it out and you'll see if you like it. And if you do like it, sometimes it goes back in the pocket because, you know, if you feel like Maryland isn't a good offensive team and you can beat them with drop coverage, which they did in the second half, then you go beat them with drop coverage. And when you start showing blitzing over and over again on film, now Penn State, now Iowa, now Purdue, like that's what they're repping in practice. And it's it's maybe not as much of a surprise. Like I thought it was for Maryland. Yeah. Like it, I made Maryland really uncomfortable. Um, and, I, you know, so that was that was cool to see. They post-trap Julian Reese. Um, now, I, now moving forward – I think they'll obviously still post trap a Zach Eady. I'm not sure there's anywhere else on the schedule here to close out where you would need to post trap. And I, here's just something and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. This is why this is what podcasts are for. Yeah. So I think when it comes to blitzing and when it comes to post trapping, you need to be careful with who your personnel is on the floor because in post trapping, where they struggled against Maryland, and I thought where a lot of their fouls came from, was post-trapping equals rotation. Rotation equals long closeouts. Hmm. And for some of the guys, and and particularly I think Quincy Garrier, like that is not his strength. I think he has a ton of strengths on the basketball court. Long closeouts in space against a guy driving him, not his strength. So – how can you combat that? I think they're they're they'll be they'd be fine blitzing ball screens because when you blitz ball screens, there's a retreat and then there's more of like a looping pass out of it to where you can you can find your way a little bit. There aren't as long of closeouts, but post trapping, especially if you're going to come from the strong side, the ball side, where hey, when I catch the ball, like the ball's entered to me, you're not trapping from somewhere that's out of my line of vision. You're trapping from the strong side. So now I can make a quick read out of it. So maybe it's trapping with somebody else that comes over. But honestly, it's just a I'm just theorizing here, man. Yeah. If you are going to post trap with Quincy Garrier on the floor, I think Quincy Garrier has to be guarding that five. Hmm. I've thought about that, Mike. Do you start putting Quincy on the five? And because I asked Coleman after the game if he liked being more aggressive. You and I have talked about it. I just feel like that plays to his strength, engages him a little bit more. He basically said that. Um, yeah. So I, I wonder if they 
go more to Quincy with the five and, and let Coleman just kind of get more aggressive uh, in that way. Yeah, again, I, I don't know how many times we're going to see it again, but if we do, I just think about what the a benefit of having Quincy at the five when he's guarding uh, the post trap is that he is not the one now that has to go and run and rotate out. That I, I trust a Coleman Hawkins way more to one, you know, be able to have enough activity. Maybe you get it. Maybe you get your hands on the ball, and you know, as you're coming over, um, you know. But having Quincy in those long closeout situations, I'm not sure it's the best. But I mean, you think about that closing group they have, Rogers. Right now, you can move around. Now you can, you know, now you can really, um, you know, maybe maybe crank up the the heat a little bit. So that was that was definitely. That was definitely cool to see because you can see that they're tank they're tinkering with different things. I think that they liked the blitzing that they did. Mm -hmm. I just think they put that they put that one back in the, the pocket. I think that was a little Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the schedule and I'm like, do you do it to Tony Perkins with all those shooters? Maybe. Um Garcia do a post trap. I don't think you're gonna do it with Owen Freeman. I think you'll trust Hawkins there. You know, Purdue, obviously, you want to post trap a little bit more, yeah, but um, yeah, you could probably save that for the postseason for the most part. I mean, look, just looking at the schedule, you might need to bust it out to, to win some of these games, but yeah, I agree yeah. with you, Mike. There might be a keep this one in the back pocket for March, but at least you know you can do it. At least they at least they brought it out because I thought it was huge yeah. that win to get that 11 2 run at the end of the half. I thought that changed the game, yeah. And I don't think we've talked, I don't think we've talked since since Michigan, but they did it once against Michigan. And it was at the end of the half, and Coleman Hawkins poked the ball away from Damari Burnett, and I kind of got on the edge of my seat. I'm like, was that? Did I just? Was that a blitz there? So um, at least you know you can play in a variety of ways, but I still think that there's something to be said about continuity, and I think they'll be repping a lot of these in practice. But you know, I think at some point, um, having it at a game and having guys comfortable doing it in a game, there's there's something to be said about that. Well, Mike, I know you're a believer in the fired coach bump, and here you go. Ohio State does Illinois a favor, uh, and we have a race. Ohio State upsets Purdue. Purdue still one loss ahead of Illinois uh, in the loss column there, but uh, they have two wins on the line. So a game and a half lead with five games left for Purdue, six for Illinois. But we got a race here, Mike, and Illinois doesn't have much margin for error, but, man, you take care of the next four. All of a sudden, you're setting up a massive one, massive matchup in uh, Champaign on March 5th. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of intrigue to to that matchup. I mean, I've I'll start by saying this: the amount of I, I'm just going to blame it on the for you function of X <laughs> now because I, I I don't know what in the world ha, I'm sitting there and and I'm scrolling on on X pregame, postgame. Purdue win, Purdue loss, Illinois win, Illinois loss. And I'm just like, is it more than previous years that this is like this hostile between Big Ten fan bases? And then I thought to myself, I'm like, not only – like before I thought you would have to like maybe search Coleman Hawkins' name, yeah. find something he said about, you know, Maryland or Purdue or whatever, and then now it's just – Everything is baked into all these people's algorithms. Yep. I even see it for me. Like I'm getting all this Purdue UConn banter. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's like UConn yelling at Purdue fans. And it's just, it's bizarre. And I think it's just created this like hostility. Super uh, hostile. Um, well, that's the stuff that goes on the for you tab because it's getting liked and commented on. And then, then you get to see it. Like, yeah, I, like I'm not liking it. any of it. Maybe yeah. I'm like interacting with it. Cause I'm just clicking on it. And I'm like, huh, that is, I like to laugh at something. that stuff. The um, amount of like, I'll just say this. There's people that think, you know, so-and-so's living rent free in someone's head and this team's living rent free. Everyone's living rent free in everyone's head based off that for you function. Uh, from what I'm seeing, but as far as the as far as the matchup goes, I think you know you've definitely put yourself in position um, to make a run at this thing. Now you like again, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I don't love if I'm Illinois. I wouldn't love being on the side of like still needing things to happen. Yeah, to have a shot. I mean, Purdue obviously controls their own destiny, but I I still think a lot is going to. Like if Michigan State, I think you still need Michigan State to beat Purdue. Uh, like I, I just think that 
you know, but if you do, I, that will at least give you a little bit of breathing room. I think because Purdue's two road games are Michigan, Illinois, right? They have Rutgers at home. They feel better. I mean, they should win that one. I know Jeremiah Williams makes them a different team, so it's not a gimme, but they're at home. Michigan State and Wisconsin just isn't the same team. Like Michigan State would scare me more uh, than Wisconsin oh, yeah. at this point, right? Oh, yeah. Because their guard play is really good. Um, Purdue did have a. I'm not. I'm not selling stock on Purdue. I, I'm not. But they had a kind of wake up week. I would imagine for Matt Painter, given they were losing by to Minnesota by eight at halftime, and then uh, to get upset by Ohio State. But uh, yeah, Illinois can you be perfect? Like right? I think they got to. They got to focus on every game, obviously. If they want a chance to win a Big Ten title, Purdue's not going to give it to them. Like, you can't count on Purdue to lose two more games. Um, you need to take care of it yourself. Yeah, you're going to have to win out. Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I think you do. Um, and it's, you know, it's possible. There's no question it's possible. Um, I mean, can you imagine if Michigan State does take somehow take care of Purdue and now you're going in? I mean, because what? Like, if Illinois had. If they, you, if they win four straight and they host Purdue and Michigan State beats Purdue, Illinois would take the sole lead yeah. in the final game. Man, I've, I, I've, been to, I've been to a number of games this year. I'm getting out to that one. Um, that would be – man, that would be, a, that'd be an all-timer, it feels like. You know, with this – and with a 20-game conference season for it to come down to – Awesome. The last week is amazing. That's credit to Brad Underwood again. Like that, they continue to be in – Hanging this around. Game. The last two weeks, they got a chance to do it. Yeah. Uh, this week at Penn State, home against Iowa, obviously favored to win both of those. What do you think of this matchup Wednesday at Penn State and then home uh, against Iowa? Uh, Penn State, I think it's a good test. Uh, it's another team that's reeling. Uh, they, they had won three straight. Now they've lost three straight and should be a pretty good environment. It sounds like they're going to do it at the volleyball oh, arena. Um which I actually think benefits Illinois, in my personal opinion. Like I, I see people all over again for you, <laughs> function. Um, like oh, like we're oh, of course we're their Super Bowl. I'm like, as a player, you don't want to go into a sleepy arena, and that place gets sleepier than any of them, right? And that place gets really sleepy. Um, I, I I would much rather go into an arena like like that and have a really good environment with however many people they have in there. I'm guessing like, what is it? 6,000 or something. Um, much rather have that. Like that gets the juices flowing much more. So um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think, um, I think it'll be a good test. I, I, I think Clary's going to play. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. To, it's he's kind of, he's in and he's out and then he's back in and then Rhodes had kind of a interesting comment after last game where it was like, he didn't travel with us was like his response. So not sure what the deal is there. Um, but then, then you got Iowa and we just talked about it, right? Do you blitz Tony Perkins? Like that's just not a team I want to see running around shooting threes with, with Sanford and Dix and, and all the, the shooters that they have. Um, they're the 13th offense in the country uh, currently now uh, on Ken Palm. And um and Perkins and Sanford, like those guys are, those guys are a handful, and those guys can, those guys can beat you. Um, we we saw that last year with with Tony Perkins. Now, do I want to see like continuing to go under on Tony Perkins from twelve feet out? No. Um, I know those are shots you want to you want to force, but you have to try to make him feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, with with what he's doing and not give him a give him a steady die because he can absolutely take over a game. We saw that. We saw that last year, but overall, this is, I just don't think this is a good matchup for Iowa. Yeah. It's just not. Um, Cause I think Illinois is capable of clamping down defensively. And I don't think Iowa is. Um, and I so. Joe Mask and Shannon could have massive games. Yeah. Like you just, but you know, you still have to take care of business and, but it's going to start on the defensive end. Yep. Um, and how, how often can you get out and transition? How often can you go find some easy ones? Um, and then really, really try to live in the pain offensively. This episode of the Illini Inquirer podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. A common misconception about relationships is they have to be easy to be right. But sometimes the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great. 
Therapy can be a place to work through those challenges you face in all your relationships, whether with your significant other, friends, work, or anyone. Guys, I know you can go through life and everything's going well, but there are things you still need to be talking through, especially in your relationships. I know my wife and I talk through a lot of these things, but sometimes it really helps to talk with someone else. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Illini today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Illini. All right, Mike, let's have fun with this. Um... Ohio State job opens up, which we think is a pretty good job. But I figure this is a good opportunity to kind of rank or tier the yeah. Big Ten basketball coaching jobs. We now have 18 of these. So uh, let's go through it, man. Uh, I got a tier list right here. Got all of the <laughs> ones. So uh, the top tier is the is the top tier. The second tier is going to be um, – I can label these here in a second. The near top tier, middle of the pack, uh, speaks for itself. And I said challenging. Kind of the, the jobs that might have a little bit upside, might be able to move up to that middle of the pack, but still there are challenges to it. And then the bottom tier speaks for itself. So uh, how do you want to start here, Mike? Do you want to stop from, start from the top? Uh, yeah. Oh, you know, if you want, we can start from the bottom. Okay. Want. Um, I think there's two, I think there's two bottom tier jobs in this league. And let me preface it by saying this. I think, a lot of a lot factors into this. I'm looking at this from the perspective of like, hey, this job came open, um, and what's the how attractive is it? Um, what are the resources? What's the history? Um, can coaches cycle in there and win? Yeah. Uh, so I, I have two teams that are that are at the bottom, and that is Penn State and Northwestern. I agree with you, and I think this is kind of a, a statement of how good Micah Shrewsbury and Chris Collins have been. A thousand percent. You took the word. You took the words <laughs> Sorry, right out of my mouth. Because yeah. I, I was doing this exercise too, and I had these two bottom tier, and I was like, "Man, those guys, Shrewsbury, obviously gone now, but Chris Collins has done an unbelievable job for how bad that job really is." Yeah, yeah. And, and credit and credit them for sticking it out with them. Um, right? I don't think he. I think he came in. He came in uh, maybe my sophomore year, which would have been. 13, 14. Um, because I think Carmody was still there my freshman year. Uh did a really good job. And, and and I think, and I think it was maybe not till year four or year five, maybe it was 17, where he they finally went to the NCAA tournament. And so, you know, they they definitely are you know reaping the benefits of that that now. They should they should see another NCAA tournament this year, which would be his third, yeah. right? Um, which is just super impressive for 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 that job and then penn state i i think yeah you look at the job that shrewsbury did it's it's um i think they came into the league in 92 93 they have seven 20 plus win seasons just 20 plus wins and they have four double digit big 10 win seasons um and four ncaa tournaments since 92 93 so really over the course of almost over 30 years um chambers did a pretty good job there yeah right? like no no he did man um he did a good job i think he brought yeah everything you know what's consistent with that program it feels like is they're like this kind of they bring in like kind of rugged you know chambers was like a tough guy and then you had you know i think Rhodes is kind of that cut from that same cloth and then when shrewsbury was in there they were running some of the best offense in the country which was not what was right typical of, of a, of a Penn state program. So um, yeah, those are the, those are the two teams. And admittedly, when, when I was thinking about this exercise, I absolutely did not include the, uh, the teams that were coming in, but I will on the fly here. Um, yeah. I, I don't think any of those are bottom. None two. of them are bottom. Yeah. yeah. None of them are bottom. Um, challenging. I had two teams in the challenging bucket again. So like, I'm going to even, even factoring in Washington, Oregon, USC, UCLA. Like, I don't think they're either of these two, two slots on the bottom. Um, 
uh, challenging, I had Minnesota and Rutgers. All right. So the one that I consider bottom tier was Rutgers. Yeah. It's why, yeah. So why, why did you put them in the challenging bucket here? I just think a bottom tier team isn't getting the top two of the top three recruits <laughs> in, in the country ever, like ever. So yeah. like that is that, that enough is like a bump up to the next rung. And, but it is, uh, we talked about how impressive Chris Collins and Shrewsbury were. That was Steve Peichel. No. Oh. I mean, they're, I, I they're love last, they've, they've gone to two NCAA tournaments under Steve Peichel. Their last six coaches they've had have gone to two NCAA tournaments. So he has all of them. And, and really should have been three last year. It's one of those relationships I, I hope both stick together. Like, yeah. I don't think Rucker should ever move on from him. I don't think Peichel should ever want to move. I, I just think they're perfect for each other. Like, I, I can't see – them without the other for the next decade. I, I just think it's a great fit. Yeah. Is there a situation where Peichel has so much success at Rutgers that there's like a top tier Big East job or or yeah. something that he's in the mix for? I don't know. I just think that's such a good marriage um, just with his mentality. I think it, it, it suits Rutgers well. Um, yeah. And then, and then Minnesota. And one thing I want to say about Rutgers, yeah. the support, man. Is better than the, the other, like it is way yeah. better than Penn State. You know, Northwestern is just a small alumni base, but Rutgers has a big alumni base and they show up and support. It's a massive yeah. school. I think it's, I think it's like a top five school in terms of like, like uh, enrollment, right? I mean, that's a, it's a massive school, correct? Or am I, am I complete? I think I'm, I I'll, maybe I'll get up, but it's, I, I think it's pretty far up there. Uh, yeah, 50,000 undergrads. Yeah. I mean, that is 70,000 uh, students at Rutgers. Yeah. It's massive. Um, so yeah, there's no question there that you have. I mean, especially in the NIL era, who knows? You, you know, that's seventy thousand students who you know. Now that the basketball program's a little bit better, now this this person that graduates six years from now f is the founder of this company and makes billions and wants to give back to the program, right? Like yeah. you give yourself a chance with with a uh, with a higher enrollment for sure. And then Minnesota. So, what makes that job so tough? is that you already have a hard time retaining in-state talent. I mean, just you can go down the list with Chet Holmgren and Jalen Suggs, Matthew Hurt. Um, you know, you have McKinley Wright. There's um, – how about even like a David Roddy yeah. that went to Colorado State that went on to the NBA. All those guys end up kind of just not going to Minnesota. But how about how many recruits you lose to Wisconsin? Yeah. I mean that go like look at the Wisconsin team: Stephen Crawl, Tyler Wall, Brad Davison, Nate Reavers, all those guys. They're all Minnesota guys. Dane Danger, Dane Danger, uh, right? Like Paint for El Payne, you were able to 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 keep home, which is great. But yeah, I just think and and Tubby had some success there. Patino went to a couple NCAA tournaments, but I just think that that piece of it is always going to be a bit challenging to get guys and in, and in, in Minnesota is probably going to have to be, I don't know either. I think they're going to have to go one of two ways, either like fully dive into the portal, which kind of done with Garcia and um, you know, Hawkins and you know, some of the other guys that they've gotten. Uh, but I just, I couldn't really put it in the middle of the pack. It was kind of a tough one that I thought was, was, was teetering, but there's something there for sure. I mean, it kind of reminds you of Illinois football in a way because sure. a lot of coaches just do not get better jobs after they like they usually get fired there. Uh, so yeah, they hired, to get, hired to get fired. Clint Haskins had all that success, the NCAA scandal. Ever since then, it just yeah, they, it hasn't worked out for them. I mean, they hire Monson from Gonzaga when he got that thing going, and and he couldn't succeed here. Then Tubby, Rich Patino. And Ben Johnson, I, I, kudos to him. He's he's probably in the top three of the Big Ten Coach of the Year thing right now, but uh, he's still got a lot to prove there. So I agree with you in that one. So who you got in the middle of the pack here? I think it's a big probably group here. So middle of the pack, yeah, it was a big group. Um, and now that I'm factoring in some of these some of these other schools, um, I had let's see, I'm I'm looking at this here. I had uh, Iowa. Mm -hmm. I had Wisconsin. Okay. I had, you can throw Washington in there. 
Yeah, I would have Washington and what USC here. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, okay, like it. Yeah, you could throw it. Let's throw let's throw USC in there too. Okay. Um, and then uh, let's see, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and uh, and my last one would be Nebraska. Okay. So right, I'll, let's start with Nebraska. Why yeah. above Minnesota and Rutgers? I I truly believe I'm I'm not kidding you. Like I think Nebraska is a sleeping giant. I really do. Like I think that that all they all they need is just a it's it's brand right. Like like if they go to a couple NCAA tournaments, it's going to become a little bit cooler to go to Nebraska. Um, I know they have resources. Oh yeah. Um, there's no question. You are one of the only shows in town quote unquote right i mean you got creighton basketball over in omaha but you're one of the only shows in town and and that that fan base we've seen it with football right like when you're good mm. they are i mean they're they're up there i think with anybody the way they support their volleyball program their baseball pro like they like you aren't just a huskers basketball fan or a huskers football fan you are a huskers fan like yes. they show up to everything yeah. if, they, if they if they start winning yeah no i think it's just been interesting to see you know going to an ncaa tournament like i said enhancing that brand and then you know it's just i i think it's just a program that can really take off i think you look back at what fred hoiberg did at iowa state um he had four out of the five seasons he was there he had four seasons above 23 wins and a lot of that was he did such a good job recruiting transfers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to continue for him. And then now you get, you know, if they make the NCAA tournament this year, now you're on a bigger stage. Now people can see you. You're not, you're no longer like this bottom dweller in the, in the big 10. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm bullish. I'm bullish on, on, yeah. on Nebraska. All right. Washington, USC. So, I mean, SC is, is always going to be a football school. Um, right. It definitely feels that way. That's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I think Enfield's done a, done a pretty good job here. Uh, it's a hell of a market to, to be in. I'm just not sure. Jeremy, how much does that matter nowadays? Right. right. How much does it matter that, I mean, LA huge talent base, right. Um, DeRozan went there, right. Like there's so much, they love basketball in LA, like Kobe, yeah. LeBron, all of it. Um, but yeah, it just, it, just, it never feels like that's a stable thing. Like, I feel like that's a team, like that's a program that one year could get to a final four out of kind of nowhere. But then otherwise I, I kind of agree with you. I think they're kind of going to be a middle of the pack, big 10 team that has talent, but I don't know, just never seems like they get to that top tier. And maybe this is me speaking from, you know, catching games that are at SC only, only so often, I just like have you ever been like man yeah, yeah. that that place is rocking compared um, to the other LA school we're going to talk about exactly um right so I, I just think that yeah both those and who knows Hopkins might be gone at Washington too mm -hmm. this year um so we'll see what type of interest is you know drums up for for that job uh yeah, that that's that that Pacific Northwest they always tend to stay in that general yeah vicinity it feels like um but but yeah i i, I bunch those two together for sure yeah i, I kind of looked up washington basketball and i forgot you know just how much success they kind of had under oh Omar, right? oh Omar was killed it there he, yeah, he, he was he was killing it there so it's it's just a school that i don't think people should overlook that uh, it, it's got potential there like they they've won conference yeah. championships and conference tournament championships in the pac-12 and and keep in mind too that's the seattle area is one of the biggest, like most underrated hotbeds for yeah. for talent. Um, so many NBA guys coming out of the Seattle area, and you know, so I, I think about this, and honestly, it's it's a similar point that I'll make for, you know, for for Maryland as well as maybe location isn't as important with recruiting nowadays, just because people try to reload with the portal, mm -hmm. but that's still important with the portal because you got guys that can potentially come back home. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a draw as well. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think Washington is a, is a good job. There's been success there in the past. I'm just, I was a little reluctant to keep it or to put it like in the top tier jobs in the big 10. I kind of lump these together. Cause I think Iowa and Nebraska have similar, um, kind of I don't know, fan bases, but where they're at, the potential, I think Fran McCaffrey's done a phenomenal job at Iowa with the, the development of players and style of play. Uh, but the two, I think that I think could argue to be in the next tier are Michigan and Wisconsin. So explain why you have them in this group. Yeah, I just, and this goes for, uh, honestly, a couple, I'll start with Wisconsin. This goes for a couple big 10 teams. I don't know what that program looks like with, uh, outside of the Bo Ryan tree since I've been alive. It's great. Really. And we've seen in guard, honestly, I don't know how much success some of these teams have had passing things off to an assistant. Guard's done a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I guess you could throw Tom Izzo and Matt Painter in that, in that uh, bucket too, with kind of the, the program being passed off. But, um, but yeah, I just think that again, I, you know, you do have a lot of good in-state talent in, in Wisconsin. Um, they do, a, they do a good job at times of, of, of retaining that talent. But um, that to me, it's just, it, it feels like it's always going to be a program of development. And in this day and age, that's, that's always going to kind of cap, I think what your potential can be on a, on a national scale. Mm -hmm. um, like they're going to have to really have it right. Straddling those two different uh, philosophies where you're, you're still recruiting and you're bringing in guys and developing them. And then you're also getting the AJ stores, the Klezmets to kind of sprinkle on top. Um, they've, they've dipped into that a little bit more than they have in, in recent years. And maybe guard goes a little bit further down, down that path. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, again, I just, I didn't feel like that was a job that like, even if that job opened, I think there would just, it would still be like, the top coaches in the country wouldn't line up to yeah. to go and get that job. I think it would be like a niche. It would be a niche like Tony Bennett's run his course at Virginia, or it's or, you know going back to where his dad. Like it would be one of those those Lamont like, Paris right now. I think Lamont can... Paris going back to where he used to coach. Like there, there's like a that feels like a call it like a connection school. Right. Like they there's always going to have to be a connection with them. It's just it's in their blood, and it's just what they've done over the over the years. How about Michigan? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about this before. I, I don't know. I think Michigan isn't as good of a job as relative to the way people talk about it. Um, Thanks to John Beeline. Yeah, right. So I think I, I just I don't know, like, how good is this job? I think at like an Ohio State, for example, they will give you the resources to be successful and they will remove barriers. Michigan creates barriers. Mm -hmm. whether it's NIL admissions for some of these transfers. And if I'm, if I'm a coach and looking at how attractive that job is, I'm not sure Michigan is at the top of the list for me because those are really, those, those two factors I've just mentioned. That's the job. That's, that's the majority of the job now. Mm -hmm. It's getting guys in, it's getting credits rolled over. It's getting the portal rolling and, and it's getting NIL going. Like that is that is the job, and that's two areas that Michigan has kind of lagged behind some of the rest of the Big Ten. So about, I don't know, six years ago, if you ask me, I'd, I'd put them in one of those top two tiers. But right now, like I think I just need to see a change there and see more of a buy-in from them. Because um, also the other side of this too, I'll, I'll talk about them being a football school. I mean, Ward, Man Ward Manuel talked about – the other day, he's like, oh, I like haven't really given a lot of thought to, you know, the basketball. You know, like you can tell they're still kind of coasting off the, 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 the football title. Yeah. But at the same time, I'll make this. I'll speak out of both sides of my mouth here. There are people that I think look at, oh, it's a football school as a negative thing, but when it comes to security, mm -hmm. that is kind of an underrated safety net because. The pressure's can, not as much. Yeah. Really I mean, you, not as much. Yeah. You can fly under the radar a little bit. And and the fact that it isn't clear cut right now that Juwan Howard 
will not be the coach at, at Michigan next year, and they might run it back, to me speaks to the fact that if that was Michigan football and that was happening, I know Harbaugh had really like one quote unquote down year, right? During COVID. But I, I don't think they were ever going to get rid of him. Right. Um, this has been like a, a almost like a sustained thing. It's felt like over the past couple of years with, with Michigan. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of, that's just kind of overall how I view that job. Should we unveil the top tier first and then get to the near top? Cause that could be a little bit more dramatic for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Like we can, we can unveil the, we can unveil the top tier. All right. Who you got in the top tier? Um, I have three schools. Oh, okay. Or actually, let me take a look at this now. Cause I, there's, you know, you yeah, you add, might add one. Yeah. Let's say I have four schools now. Yeah. So I have, you can throw UCLA in there. Speaks for itself, right? History. Yeah, it speaks for itself for sure. Um, Recent history. Throw uh, throw Ohio State in there. Wow. All right. Um, Indiana. No question. Michigan State. All right. All right. We'll get to the Illinois part of this conversation. I'm glad we did this top tier first, but yeah. I think UCLA, Indiana speak for itself, right? The history there, the resources, the support. Um, Indiana, this is why it surprises me that they've struggled so much because they just haven't made good hires lately. And that's why I, I, I question, are you really going to stick with Mike Woodson when what we've seen does not suggest he'll be that guy to make you a top-tier programming? And I think they should just have higher standards. But Michigan State, um, my question to you, Mike, would be what are they without Izzo? But Judd Heathcote has been pretty good. They've had two phenomenal coaches in a row. Uh, but Ohio State in that top tier. So break it down. Yeah. So let's start with let's start with UCLA. I think I, I don't need to spend a ton of time on them. I mean, you're you're looking at one of the most storied programs in, in college basketball history. And them just like, you know, just like USC in a way over the past couple of years, done a great job of churning out. NBA talent. I think it's been definitely more consistent at, at UCLA over the last few years. Um, but, but no question. I think if that, you know, if that job came available, it would be, you know, everybody lining up to, you know, to, to go yes. after that job. Um, you know, and I'll say this too. So before anyone freaks out about Illinois, not being in the top tier, like I, I truly think that you could, you're splitting here hairs here. I think you could you could really combine a lot of these and put them into like a, a top tier. Um for me. Well, the way I looked at the near top is that they could be in the top tier within a season. Like I, yes. I, I like 100%. I think you and I are splitting hairs. Like I would probably have Purdue and Illinois in the top tier right now, but in Ohio State in the near top. But I think any of these schools that we're talking, these top eight can win a national championship. Yes. No, I I, I completely agree. I think Ohio State, um, I think it's a it's a super attractive job. I think that they, uh, there's no doubt that they, you know, put their put their coaches in a, in a good position to be successful with resources. Um, that's been, you know, pretty well reported. I think, and um, you know, and then again, I, I just think that that's a they have a solid fan base. I know a lot of that is is focused on on football, but um, you're coming in and again, NIL resources, you know, maybe it's facilities, although you do have too big of a arena, first of all. Yes. Um, I just think that that it's one of those jobs that a lot of coaches would line up to, to want to go after. So um, the, I, I, I think they're going to hire, I think they're going to have a great group of candidates. Pick of the litter. I, mm -hmm. I like, I, I think they're going to, you know, there's, there's going to be a, whether it's Sean Miller or whether it's, like if they get Sean Miller, that's a top tier job now. No question. Like I, 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 my, I think Sean Miller's a top three to five coach in college basketball. And if those are the types of guys that you're attracting, yeah, um, then then to me that's a top tier job. Yeah. Um, now, Indiana. This you know this one is interesting. You've had five different coaches since Bob Knight, and you've gone to twelve NCAA tournaments. Um, so you've had some some success there. I mean, Archie Miller was really the lone coach that i mean even kevin kelvin sampson's one plus year that he was there um you know went to an ncaa tournament um so there's a lot of tradition there 
And I think, you know, when you look at, like, that's not a good team this year. Like, not at all. But when I turn on an Indiana game, you couldn't tell by looking at that arena. It's an, um, event. It's an event every time. Yeah. I mean, they, they do such a good job of of packing that thing out. And and I, I think it's just part of the branding element of it with, with Indiana basketball is, you know, and you, you mentioned it with Archie Miller and with Mike Woodson. Archie, you I thought you that higher, like you tried to get a little cute um with it. And and Archie had a ton ton of success at Dayton. And uh, but Mike Woodson, you went the alumni route. I mean, how many times we got to see that not work out? Um, if you're Indiana basketball, you gotta go big game hunting. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're a basketball school and and you should. I mean, I, I don't I don't know what I mean, they've always talked about Brad Stevens popping mm -hmm. up. I don't think he'll ever take that job. Um, but I just feel like it's all there. And even like their partnership with Adidas, like they're doing things that are kind of, um, you know, lends itself to, to quote unquote kids these days. And like the yeah. recruits and the shifting of the jerseys last night and, and the, you know, whatever fear of God or whatever the um, thing like, they were rolling out there. If that job came open and I, for one, think it should in the next two years. Um, if that job came open, they should get Nate Oates. They should get, um, who's the one at go after Scott drew. Like th there's no reason you couldn't go for somebody like that. Like Ohio state is potentially with a Sean Miller, go after Shaka smart. Like they should be going after some of the best coaches in the country. Cause I think it should be one of the best programs in the country. Yeah. And you, you mentioned you, you helped me uh, with a great segue here into my next team. Cause I agree on all fronts there with with Indiana and you just mentioned you know if the next two years you know they part ways with Mike Woodson or if in the next two years Tom Izzo decides to hang it up I mean how about Nate Oates right? which I'm starting to feel like it's pretty close to the end for Tom Izzo just, yeah and again I, I think you could bunch like is like Michigan State this is a you know that is a basketball brand as well and I mean, Tom Izzo's done a hell of a job with with that program. I mean, Judd Heathcote was obviously a great coach as well, but the sustained excellence from them. Um, we'll see when this when Izzo moves on. We'll see if this was a Michigan State thing or an Izzo thing, mm -hmm. um, right? Uh, and maybe it's going to be maybe it's going to be a little bit of both. But um, I think looking at how much success that program has had. And they've done it, not even fully diving into NIL or the portal. <laughs> I mean, they could but, be a Big Ten title contender if they would have gone to the portal this offseason. Yeah, I mean, Izzo, Izzo has kind of been steadfast with, hey, no, we got our guys, we're good, we'll just continue to build. And he's kind of been right. Um, you know, they definitely, they've definitely been tough. They were overrated coming into this year, and, and they're they're probably properly rated now and making their way for – you know, they could definitely finish third in this, in this conference. So um, yeah, I just, it, it's a great fan base, obviously, just like all these schools. I mean, I, you could, you could say that for a lot of them, um, but we'll see. I mean, once Izzo moves on, I think that wh whether you see it with Bayheim, you saw it with Villanova and Jay Wright, like the pass off to the assistants that are familiar with the program I'm just – I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's the the play. I think if you're Michigan State, I think you got to go – you got to go get a – go get a NATO. Let's go get some of these other guys. And was it Dwayne Stevens? He left to take Central Michigan, and that's not going all that well so far. And, and Dane Fife felt like he could have been potentially that guy and then went to Woodson staff and career just took a downturn from there. All right, near top tier, Illinois, Maryland. I think they're very similar programs. Purdue, similar program. Oregon as well so give it to us why yeah. why was illinois not in your top tier Mike? i i mean it wasn't honestly it wasn't even like you could easily put them in that that top tier um i think which it's a credit to brad underwood that we yeah, would consider I mean, them a top tier program or like fans would be upset at that right now because right now i think brad underwood has made them that again before he arrived i would probably would add a middle of the pack yeah, yeah. no i agree i i think and it all depends on how we're looking at this, right? Like in terms of 
like if this was based off of you know Brad Underwood leaves after the season and this team is coming back with Terrence Shannon and Coleman like that changes the job because it's you know then that's absolutely a top tier job this is kind um, of the lens we're looking at it, right? Is right is the job. Like how 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 good is the job if it came open today? How is it thought of? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're in the top tier near top, like that's your you're one of the best jobs in the country. Yeah. Um, and I that's that's how I look at Illinois. And I think, you know, all, like I said, all these teams can can be on that line. Um, but you've seen firsthand with just the again, resources, what they've done to Ubbin what they've done to the state farm center. Um, and granted for a long time, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I was in oven. Luther head was in oven. You know, Brian cook was in, Brian oven. cook was in oven. Um, just like the oven kind of, as it was, you know, we changed some things. I think when I left, they changed the furniture. Um, right. But, but the complete overhaul that they've had to make that one of the best facilities in the country. Um, that's to me, what, like if you want to make a case to put Illinois up into that top tier, that's, that's one of the cases right there is I, I truly think that they're the oven facility is one of the best I have seen in the, and I've seen a decent amount of practice facilities. It is one of the best I've seen in the country, like bar none. They are there. There is no question. And then you factor in as well. I mean, if, if, that job were to somehow come available is Adam Fletcher staying mm -hmm. because like that, that is another element too, where like all the tech that they have now, the recovery and what he does for that. Pro like it is, it's um, I'm almost convincing myself that it's, it's, it's top tier, but again, I'm, I'm ex making the case of why it could be top tier and I still have them near top. I think, I think another, um, huge factor for Illinois is I think you have one of the best athletic directors in the, in the sport. Um, I think you've seen that he just like, he gets it. He's, he's progressive on, on the right topics in, in, in college basketball and, um, and in college sports, because it's not only just for the Illinois basketball program, but, um, but then just the backing as well, right. It's a really, it's, it's a passionate fan base. I was there when we were a top 10 team and that place was sold out and rocking. And I was there when we, you know, my senior year, when we sputtered a little bit and won five big 10 games. And I, honestly, like the arena didn't look in, like crazy different. No, nope. um, they'll like, they show up and they show out. And, and so, and like that passion is something that I think would, would be really attractive for, you know, for a coach, because you, that's like, that's like for like first thing is like, do people care about this program? And to be honest with you, Mike, that's why I had Illinois and Purdue in the top tier. Yeah. Because they could not be good and they show up like yeah. Maryland. We've seen when they're not good, they, they don't show up all that much. Uh, Michigan can be the same. Um, I, I just feel like, yes, some of these other jobs, Indiana, UCLA, maybe even Ohio state to some people could be a better job. But like, I, I just think that resources, they both have really good ADs, I believe as, as yeah. well. Um, those two to me are just, I would probably have them top tier because of that support is just unbelievable. Most of the NIL is going to basketball at those schools as well. Yeah. I think that helps. Yeah. I mean, I think when you like, when you break it down that way, and if that is like a big part of your criteria, which for me, like again, I was I'm thinking from the standpoint of like job comes available. Sure. What is like what is like the quality, the quality of, of the candidate pool? And Purdue, I'd be really interested to see. That's what I'm saying. Like, and, and this is my thinking, right? Like yeah. that's that's why I looked at it. Now, if you want to look, if you want to talk about like resources, facilities, all of that, like like because again, I guess that's kind of how I viewed I graded Nebraska and put mm -hmm. them up. So like but yeah, no, Illinois, Illinois and Purdue would be in the top tier. Um, no doubt about it. Um, now, I guess kind of moving on here, Maryland, this, this one was really interesting to me because you've seen it when it's right. Mm -hmm. And 
they have really, I, I, I truly think like they've been one of the better uh, talk, talk about the additions. They've, they've definitely been the best addition thus far. We'll see with the PAC 12 teams. They've been the best addition to the big 10 at, since this, you know, kind of realignment happened and the shift over from the ACC and, um, you know, they, they came right out. I mean, their first year in the big 10, they won 27 games. Mm-hmm. Um, they've, you know, they've gone to six NCAA tournaments since they've been in the big 10. Um, I think again, this goes back to like the recruiting element of it. That is such a hotbed. Again, the DMV area, when you look at schools, like, you know, high schools like Gonzaga and DeMatha and all the schools that are out there. And it's definitely a pro to be in that area, but I just think less, it's less about high school recruiting now and more about getting, you know, potentially a Hunter Dickinson or like these type of guys that are from the DMV back in the DMV. Um, because so when you like at Illinois, when you miss on Chicago kids, when you miss on these kids or you don't recruit them hard enough, you hear about it endlessly. Yes. So it's like a double-edged sword. It's like great to have those things. That's why Illinois, and Maryland, I, I, it's not wrong to have them next to each other. Cause those are two very similar programs in my opinion too. Yeah, yeah. no, totally. And I, and I think I like, we'll see what happens with, I've seen some NIL comments from, from Willard that don't, fire me up a ton but then that's a that's a again that's a philosophy though because there could be somebody else that comes in that has the resources like i think i saw willard say say something to the effect of like we don't do bidding wars here Mm -hmm. or something and it's like well welcome to (laughs) college basketball and and um yeah i mean i i like i i think it's i've seen it when it's right and when it's rolling and it's and it's man that arena that those students it's it's um won a national championship like one they, of their, yeah, they're the most the recent one in the Big Ten. Yeah. Right. So, you know, then and then Oregon. I mean, well, I, I think Altman may be coming to might be coming to the end there uh at some point. So, like I view that, like I think Illinois is a better job than Oregon. Um, I, I just wasn't ready to really put Oregon at the middle of the pack. But like when you talk about, you know, Nike and yeah. uh you know, everything that's in proximity to them. And that's and, all you have to say is Nike. I, yeah. I just think that the power of Phil Knight, the power of that machine, that yeah. brand now, not just Nike, but Oregon brand associated with that. I think it's ceiling is, is huge. It's huge. Uh, they could be a middle of the pack kind of production wise, but I just think the ceiling is higher than a lot of those programs in the middle of the pack. Yeah. yeah. And, and they always get, and it's interesting to look at this. I mean, how this this exercise might come to fruition because there's there's we can look and forecast out to how the Pac-12 looks coming into the Big Ten and these teams and um, but UCLA, Ohio State, Indiana, Michigan State, Oregon, Michigan, Washington, USC, um, all those teams might have new coaches in the next two years, mm-hmm. right? Like I don't think. Is UCLA going to fire Mick Cronin? I don't. I don't think so. But he may. He may go. He may go to another. To another job, right? If Louisville wants to throw a ton of money at him when he wants to get back to, kind of being. I know he's from Cincinnati. I think so. He's like, kind of grown up there. He's a little bit closer to home. Um, obviously, Ohio State's open. Indiana could be open. What happens with Izzo? Oregon might move on from Altman. Like. You know, Washington might move on from Hopkins. Is Enfield running out of time in USC? So, like, how we view these schools coming into the back 12 could be totally different in a few years, right? Like, someone could come into Oregon and just absolutely get that thing back rolling. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then Purdue, here's kind of – here's, here's like, my, my, my case on Purdue is, again, like, what does this program look like outside of the KD Painter tree? I don't know. It's like it it reminds me almost of like a like a Wisconsin in a sense where it's yeah. like there's got to be some some blood relation <laughs> like some something within the the tree like it, it feels weird to see like to think one it feels weird to think about that job being open cuz that it's hard for me as <clears throat> someone that doesn't remember and he's early. still so young. I mean, that painter is. I mean, he could be twenty. He could, he could be twenty more years there. He's fifty-three years old. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I was thinking of like, well, who could be the next guy? And Shrewsbury's the name. 
right? Like you just have him come in and be that guy. But Painter, I think he's going to be there for another decade at least. Yeah, I, yeah, at least. And I think I don't know. I mean, it's just interesting to think about that program without those guys. I mean, just like Michigan State, it's hard to think about that. Like Izzo has kind of become Michigan State, and Painter, Painter is Purdue, where they're just like you know they're kind of this like hard nosed, smart team they've kind of they've kind of always been that way yeah and you talk about the fan base so you know one of the best fan bases in in the big 10 just like illinois and and um you know in indiana and, and those teams but um i don't know like i i think with painter i keep making the correlation to wisconsin in a way and i don't want like purdue fans to get offended by that because it shouldn't be taken with any offense i just think those programs have been so similar in the way that they've kept this lineage mm-hmm. between coaches. They've really, really hammered home development over, over shifting philosophies, right? Like Edie committed to Purdue, stayed at Purdue, right? Same thing with Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer. Um, now you got Lance Jones. But Caleb first was a you know was a recruit that that came in and Mason Gillis same thing like all those Morton like that team is comprised of a lot of guys that have been at and stayed at Purdue yeah. um, so what what does that look like right like they <clears throat> certainly from like a national perspective Painter's done a great job of building that I think they have like would you say <clears throat> excuse me would you say that their national perception like how good is it now compared to maybe recent years? Cause like they've been so successful, but then you have the FDU and you have like the St. Peter's like, I, I it's hard to. Yeah. I, I think it's different because the Kaminsky Wisconsin teams, right. Uh, though those teams were some of the elite teams in the country get to final fours. It feels like these ED teams are thought of similarly to that, but is the program thought of like Kentucky or Kansas? Probably not. Right, I think it's more about the the player that they have um, is is one of the greatest college basketball players of all time, most productive college basketball players of all time. But I, I'm sorry, I just got this thought that Matt Painter's fourth in the Big Ten with 436 wins. Like, I think that's Big Ten wins. He's, yeah. I think he's there until he passes up Tom Izzo, whatever that is. So that's 15. Plus years, probably because time is what is that like another 200 wins or something? 704, 250, he's like 270 behind. But I mean, he could do that, like that's what Painter could do. So I think he'll stick there until there. But yeah, I think I think Purdue and Wisconsin are a little bit similar. I just think the Purdue basketball fan base is a little bit agreed, more passionate. A hundred percent. No, I I I agree. I'm talking more so just like they're just their their <coughs> philosophies over the years. Yeah. I think have been really similar with development and the way they they've kind of done their staff as well. But yeah, if those jobs came open, similar candidates probably. Wisconsin and Purdue. Say that again. Would Wisconsin and Purdue have similar candidates? I again, like I think so and that's that's part of the part of how I looked at this. Yeah. Was like you know there's going to have to be a connection. There's going to have to be like, that's just how these schools operate. Um, right. Like that. I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that you could bunch those and it works for them. two in together and it works for them. They win a hell of a lot of games. Yeah. Uh, we'll see if they can do that in the NCAA tournament, Mike, uh, we went long here, but this was a fun exercise and it was an interesting exercise. And I'm interested to see all the comments from this one, but it's the near <laughs> top in the, in the top tier, I think, you know, Purdue and Illinois have the discussion of that. I think Michigan and Wisconsin could move up potentially. Yeah. Like we're, we're splitting hairs here, but uh, I think you got this for the most part, man. Yeah. Again, I don't want I don't want anyone coming at me here. Um, <laughs> I hope I, I hope I, I articulated that well because being in that you know near top top tier, like you're, it's kind of one and the same to be honest. And you can make depending on which levers you're pulling, I think it pulls each of these schools up or down. Um, without- well, and I think I think when Illinois does get the higher right, that the job goes up a tier. Like yes. when they they hire Lon Kruger, they're able to go get Bill Self. They hire Bill Self, 
then they kind of want somebody who's going to stick around and Bruce Weber and then John Gross obviously was not the, the right hire, even though I'm a big fan of John personally. And he's, I think he's a guy who in this cycle could move up Mike um, because there, there's some dominoes that could fall, whether it's Sean Miller leaving Xavier, or, you know, some of these other jobs that could open up. I think John could be a candidate for, but you hire Brad Underwood and all of a sudden you're back to being one of these jobs that we can talk about for the top tier. So that's why I think Illinois is, in that top five, top six mix in this in this conference. If let's if John Gross some like got the Xavier job, yeah, would that be the first set of brothers to coach a school? Wow, yeah, because Travis Steele was it. Would that keep him away from that job? I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like that. You could look at that one of two ways. Yeah, like either it's a guy that's really advocating for it, or a guy that's like, dude, don't go there. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. I'm really, I'm really happy for, for Gross. Uh, he's obviously had a lot of success at, at Akron, and um, and it was also interesting. Just when when Ohio State let go of Holtman last week, I was just, it got my, it got my juices flowing a little bit because I, the carousel. I am a carousel guy over a portal guy. Um, <laughs> that's just, I don't know. That's just, that's just what I gravitate towards. Portal's awesome. Well, when- it becomes so hard to like kind of keep up with to be honest but the well, carousel is just carousel's nice when that carousel starts spinning we'll start tearing these jobs how about that we'll do that yeah let's do it man <laughs> mike you're the goods man thanks for the extra time today this is a fun exercise all right man appreciate it